This week, we unveil the coolest contest ever. Then, we're going to dive into the history of the ritual. Where the heck does it come from? Who came first? Thomas Smith Webb? Preston? Anderson? I don't know. But we're going to find out. Then, there's a little knock at the door. Who is it? It's Steve L. Harrison, the illustrious brother who brings us the Masonic Minute every other week. He's got a great segment on just what happens when you join a new body. Finally, we're going to wrap it up with Part 2, Chapter 4 of Max Hindle's Ancient and Modern Initiation with a chapter on the Transfiguration. Is the Transfiguration something that happens in all men? Probably. But to hear all about it, you're going to have to give a listen. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 489. First thing is first. I want to thank the contributors to this program. That means all the supporters of this show, the contributors, the fellows, the producers, the legacy partners. Without you, we cannot do this program. And one of the things that I wanted to do was offer something really special just for the people who make this show possible. So whether you are a contributor, a fellow, a producer, a legacy partner on either PayPal or Patreon, I want you to consider trying out for this little experiment. A special link was emailed to you or you saw it in Patreon as a post just for you subscribers or you got a Facebook notification about it within our Craftsman Plus group. Maybe you saw some of the promotion that I ran for this this last week. And if you're hearing this now, you only have a few days to fill this out. But here's the catch. You're going to click a link to a Google form. Put your information in there. And from there, you're going to take a fun quiz about the WCY podcast. Then at the end, there's a couple little short essay questions about Freemasonry, what you love about the craft, that kind of thing. And what we're going to do is pick one lucky winner. That winner is going to get a really awesome package. This package, I will send the package to you But here's what's inside of it, okay? First of all, I bought two tickets to the Mid-Atlantic Esotericon virtual conference this year. I am giving one of those away to this winner. This winner is going to get to virtually attend the Mid-Atlantic Esotericon, which happens on June 12th. The conference of Esotericon is the first of its kind conference about esoteric, hermetic, initiatic, and transcendental topics. It was founded in 2019, and the mission is to bring together like-minded individuals for a day of education, fellowship, and immersion in an effort to break the stigma associated with esoteric topics. Now, here's the awesome part. This ticket was one of the early bird tickets, which means there is some kind of swag. There's some, there's a t-shirt and some other things that you get with that ticket. And I'm giving that stuff to you. It will be sent directly to you along with any access codes you need to attend the Mid-Atlantic Esotericon. Who are the speakers? They have Jamie Paul Lamb, Brother Ben Williams, Adam Goldman, Chuck Dunning, Ryan Flynn, Ben Wallace, and Dr. Justin Sledge. So these guys are going to do this awesome conference, and I think it's going to be great. I mean, I bought a ticket myself, so I hope you enjoy. But not only is that going to happen? Not only is that the only gift in the box, right? The next thing that I'm going to include is the Southern California Fraternal Review decided to come out with a special gift set, which is the Four Cardinal Virtues gift set. There's four issues of the Fraternal Review, each covering temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. It's in a really nice shrink-wrapped folder that has some great artwork with it. In addition to that, they only made 100 of these sets. There are four greeting cards with envelopes, all themed after the four cardinal virtues. And this is a $45 set they sell on their website, theresearchlodge.com. But here's the cool part. They only made 100 of these. That's it. 100. And this one is number 19 out of 100. It's labeled and written on in silver Sharpie, 19 out of 100. So you'll get that also with your Esotericon ticket. I'm also throwing in one of the Rider Waite tarot decks. So all three of those things is yours totally for free. You already support this program. If you don't support this program, you can sign up and still get a chance to win. But this ends on April 
7th. So that means you don't have time to wait if you want to do this. If you're a supporter of this program, click the link, go through, fill it out. And what I'm going to do is I'll see who has the highest score. And then ties will be broken from the essay answers. So I hope you all enjoy. Good luck. This is my way of just saying thank you guys for making this program uh, almost 10 years now. We're coming up on 10 years. This is not like a 10-year thing we're doing. This is just me saying thank you to you. There's no catch, nothing. Okay, if you already support this show, I already have your address and stuff. There's no weird baloney going on behind the scenes. I just want to throw this out there and give somebody something awesome. And that thing is Ticket to Esotericon with the swag, the limited edition Four Cardinal Virtues Southern California Research Lodge Fraternal Review gift set and a tarot deck. Me to you. That's it. No catch. So get on there, click the link, fill it out, and good luck to you guys. Thank you so much for allowing me to bring this program to you this long and for listening week after week and most importantly for supporting this program. If you want to learn more about how to support this program, head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on support the show and check out your options. Now, the next thing we're going to get into is recently uh, a friend of mine reached out and he said, hey man, what's the deal with Preston and Webb and the ritual? What came first? Yada, yada, yada. What's the story behind this? Like, there's all of these stories and, and people mix them up all the time. What's the definitive answer? And so I looked around for a good research paper that had a really nice argument and wasn't, you know, a whole book length thing. So what we're going to do is get right into that right now. So this is the web ritual in the United States. And this was published back in June of 1916 in the Builder magazine. And it was published by Wisconsin's own brother Silas H. Shepard. Now, Silas H. Shepard actually has the only research lodge in Wisconsin named after him. It gives you just a little bit of an idea how big of a deal that guy was. So uh, let's get right into this. The Web Ritual in the United States by brother Silas H. Shepard, Wisconsin, the Builder, June 1916. The year 1717 will ever stand out as the prominent date in the history of Freemasonry. Since then, we have voluminous written and printed records. Before then, we had about a hundred old manuscript charges, a few mentions of Freemasonry and biography and laws, and very few lodge minutes. Previous to 1717, the rituals or forms and ceremonies of reception of candidates and other work of the lodge were most probably given in the language and manner the presiding officer chose. It may have been in a set form of words, which form was transmitted orally from one generation to another. Soon after the quote-unquote revival of the organization of the Grand Lodge in 1717, Reverend James Anderson, the author of the Book of Constitutions of 1723, and Dr. John T. Desaglier, the mastermind of the organization, arranged the lectures into the form of questions and answers for the first time and this was adopted by the Grand Lodge as authentic lectures. In 1732, Martin Clare revised the lectures and made a few Christian applications which were not in strict conformity to the cosmopolitan character of the fraternity. Dr. Thomas Manningham and Thomas Dunkery were the next to quote-unquote improve the work, and Dr. Manningham's prayer is still used with slight modifications in opening a lodge and at the reception of candidates. Thomas Dunkerley is said to have given the theological ladder its three principal rounds. In 1763, Worshipful Master Hutchinson again revised and quote-unquote improvised the lectures and gave more Christian applications to their rites and ceremonies. The greatest of all ritualists, however, was William Preston, who was made a mason in a lodge of ancients in 1763, and soon after induced that lodge to be reconstituted by the moderns. In 1767, he became master of his lodge. He believed that Freemasonry should not only be a progressive moral science, but that it should have an educational value in giving its votaries more knowledge of the liberal arts and sciences. His illustrations of Masonry was the result, and no book having more influence has ever been written on Freemasonry. He was the father of the Monitor. By 1774, he had completed his system 
of quote-unquote work and established a school of instruction. And from that time to the present, the Preston work has been, and undoubtedly far into the future it will continue to be, one of the most potent influences of the ritual. Preston's work continued to be the standard work for the Grand Lodge of England until 1813 when the United Grand Lodge adopted the Hemming Lectures. The Hemming Lectures differ in many particulars from the Preston. The Preston Lectures are still given once a year in England under the auspices of a foundation made for that purpose. When Freemasonry was first established in America is an open question. We are not quite sure that the stone with the date 1606 is really a Masonic stone of that date, or if that Mordecai Campanell and his companions conferred the degrees of Masonry in 1656 at Newport, Rhode Island, neither are we certain as to where Freemasonry was first practiced in this country by authority of a Grand Lodge of England after 1717. It is, however, well known that lodges were established in the colonies, and that Daniel Cox, Henry Price, and James Graham were issued deputations as provincial Grand Masters. The ritual of the English lodges would naturally have been the one used in the English colonies. And, in this connection, it is well to call attention to the fact that the Grand Lodge of England, according to the old institutions, or ancients, was established in 1751, and from that time until 1813, chartered lodges in all of the colonies. In many of the colonies, there were two conflicting provincial Grand Lodges. In the establishment of the ancient Grand Lodge, changes were made which were of considerable importance. Uniformity was not accomplished in England until 1813, and it had not yet been attained and probably never will be attained in America. Pennsylvania still retains the ancient work. After the colonies had declared their independence of Great Britain, the provincial Grand Lodges naturally declared their independence of the Grand Lodges to which they owed their origin. Each was then a sovereign Grand Lodge. To return to the lectures, they took the form of the place whence they came, and were quite probably not transmitted with a great degree of accuracy, and were not very uniform in the United States at the close of the 18th century. Thomas Smith Webb was born in Boston, Massachusetts, October 13, 1771, and became a printer or bookbinder. Early in the life, he became a mason and a teacher of masonry. In 1797, he published the quote-unquote Freemason's Monitor. He subsequently did more for masonry than almost anyone else in his day, and was probably personally instrumental in the founding of the American Rite or System of Degrees of Royal Arch, Council, and Commandery. What we are particularly interested in, however, is his connection with ancient craft masonry. About the close of the 18th century, a printer named Hanmer came to America and brought the Preston work. He communicated it to Webb. Soon afterward, Webb abridged it, arranged it differently, as to sections, and taught this revision to Benjamin Gleason, Henry Fowle, Brother Snow, and others. In 1806, a joint committee of six, of which Brothers Gleason and Fowle were members, met and agreed upon the Webb work as the standard work of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Brother Jeremy Cross claimed to have received his work from this committee. In an address before the Grand Lodge of Vermont in 1859, Grand Master Philip Tucker gave much valuable information from which we excerpt the following. Quote, about the year 1800, 12 years after the publication of Preston's Illustrations and English Brother, whose name I have been unable to obtain, came to Boston and taught the English lectures as they had been arranged by Preston. The Grand Lodge of Massachusetts approved them, and they were taught by Thomas S. Webb and Henry Fowle of Boston, and Brother Snow of Rhode Island. About the year 1801, Brother Benjamin Gleason, who was a student of Brother Webb, received them from him, and embodied them in a private key of his own. About the year 1805, Brother Gleason was employed by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts to teach all the subordinate lodges of that jurisdiction, and was paid for that service. $1,500. To those lectures, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts still adheres, with a very slight variation in the fellow craft and master's degree. Brother Snow afterwards changed and modified the lectures he had received, mingling with them some changes from other sources, so that the system of lectures descending through him is not reliable. Brother Gleason was appointed Grand Lecturer of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts in 1805, 
and that Grand Lodge appointed no other Grand Lecturer until 1842. He was a liberally educated man, graduated at Brown University in 1802, and was a public lecturer on geography and astronomy. He was a member of Mount Lebanon Lodge in Massachusetts in 1807 and died in Concord in that state in 1847, at the age of 70. He visited England and exemplified the Preston Lectures as he had received them from Brother Webb before the Grand Lodge of England and the Masonic authorities of that grand body pronounced them correct. In the year 1817, Brother John Barney, formerly of Charlotte, Vermont, went to Boston and received the Preston Lectures there as taught by Gleason and as they were approved by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. I am unable to say whether he received them from Brother Gleason himself or from Brother Henry Fowle. My impression is that he received them from Brother Fowle. In possession of these lectures he returned to Vermont, and at the annual communication of our Grand Lodge in October of 1817, visited that grand body and made known the fact. The subject was submitted to a committee for examination which reported that these lectures were according to the most approved method of work in the United States and proposed to give Brother Barney letters of recommendation to all lodges and brethren wherever he may wish to travel as a brother well qualified to give useful Masonic information to anyone who may wish his services. The Grand Lodge accepted and adopted the report of its committee and Brother Barney under the recommendation thus given visited many of the then existing lodges of this state and imparted to them a knowledge of these lectures. Among others, in the year 1818 he visited Dorchester Lodge in Virginis and imparted full instructions in them to right worshipful Samuel Wilson, now and for several years past Grand Lecturer of the State. Upon this occasion Brother Barney wrote out a portion of them in private key, and Brother Wilson wrote out the remainder. Both were written in the same book and that part written by Brother Wilson was examined carefully and approved by Brother Barney. That original manuscript is still in existence and is now in possession of my son, Brother Philip C. Tucker Jr. of Galveston, Texas, to whom Brother Wilson presented it a few years ago. Brother Wilson has a perfect copy of it and refers to it as authority in all cases of doubt. Brother Gallup of Liberty Lodge at Franklin was one of the original Grand Lodge Committee and is still living to attest to the correctness and identity of these lectures as taught by Barney in 1817. These are the only lectures which have been sanctioned in this jurisdiction from October 1817 to present day. The Grand Lodge has sanctioned no others. My predecessors, Grand Masters Robinson, Whitney, Wales, and Haswell, sustained them against all innovation, and to the extent of my power I have done the same. I think upon these facts, I am justified in saying that the lectures we use are the true lectures of Preston. Webb changed the arrangement of the sections as fixed by Preston, for one which he has thought more simple and convenient, but as I understand, he left the body of the lectures themselves as Preston had established them. Subsequently to 1818, Brother Barney went to the western and southwestern states. He was a man in feeble health at the time and pursued Masonic lecturing as a means of substance. Upon his return to this state a few years afterward, he stated to his brethren here, as I have been credibly informed and believe, that he found different systems of lecturing prevailing at the West and Southwest, and that upon presenting the lectures he had been taught at Boston in 1817 to different Grand Masters, they were objected to, and that various Grand Masters would not sanction his lecturing in their jurisdictions, unless he would teach the lectures then existing among them that desiring to pursue his occultation, he did learn the different systems of lecturing then existing in the different states, and taught them in the different states' jurisdictions as desired by the different Grand Masters in each. This circumstance accounts for the strange disagreement between the East and West and Southwest as to what are true Barney lectures. They meant one thing in New England and another in the West." End quote. Again, in 1861, the Grand Master, he says, Quote, Brother Gleason was appointed Grand Lecturer of Massachusetts in 1805 and no other Grand Lecturer was appointed by that Grand Lodge until 1842. During all this time, Brother Fowle was a member, sometimes a subordinate officer and occasionally Master of St. Andrew's Lodge of Boston, one of the oldest and best informed lodges in the world. For most of this time, also, Brother Gleason was at home in Massachusetts and holding his office of Grand Lecturer of his state 
It is not a very violent presumption to assume that he did not know what lectures and what kind of work were taught in one of the strongest lodges of Boston. I knew Brother Henry Fowle from my boyhood. My father was one of his intimate friends, and they were members and officers of the same charter. Brother Fowle was a man of far more mind and attainments than are usually found among men of his sphere of life. He was not a man to forget anything and was too tenacious a mason to make changes without authority. But setting all inferences from such considerable aside, I remark that I was present at St. Andrew's Lodge in 1823 or 1824 and saw the work done, Brother Fowle taking part in it that evening as a subordinate officer and the work was identically that which has been practiced in this jurisdiction from 1818 to this day, as exemplified in the lectures communicated to Wilson by Barney. I add also that I was subjected upon another occasion to a thorough examination in an anteroom of the Masonic Hall upon a visit to St. Andrew's Chapter by a strong examination committee, which, finding that I had answered readily, ran through the lectures in entire from entered apprentice to Royal Arch, and that the whole of them were identical with those in use in the lodges and chapters of Vermont. There can be no doubt, then, that the lectures communicated by Fowle to Barney were the genuine lectures taught by Webb and Gleason, the same which Gleason received from Webb in 1801 or 1802, the same which he taught as Grand Lecturer of Massachusetts from 1805, the same that I found among the Boston Masons in 1823 or 1824, and the very same which are taught there now. Was there any opportunity for them to be falsified in their translation from Barney to Wilson? Barney received them in 1817 and made private notes of them. In October of that same year, he submitted them to the Grand Lodge of Vermont and got its permission to teach them in this jurisdiction. He was well known here was a man of integrity and had every motive of interest and honor to preserve them in their purity. In 1818 and before, he had gone from the state to teach elsewhere at all. He imparted them to Brother Wilson, having his original notes before him and aiding that brother of making a correct copy of them when they came into use practically. They were found to exactly agree with those used in the jurisdiction from which Barney received them. There seems no room for error or mistake here. The link in the chain of transmission is not broken at all. The work of Webb was evidently well done, and in his lifetime there existed a fairly uniform method where he or his disciples taught. He died in 1819. Jeremy L. Cross published the True Masonic Chart in 1819. It was the Webb Monitor with the addition of a series of illustrations of the emblems. This feature had been copied in most monitors since. The Morgan excitement in 1826 put Masonic activity to a disadvantage, and there was little done from 1826 to 1839 or thereabouts. Then there was a revival of interest and an agitation for uniform work resulting in the Baltimore Convention of 1843, at which the delegates adopted the web work. John Barney, of whom Philip Tucker speaks, was made a Mason in Friendship Lodge No. 20 at Charlottesville, Vermont in 1811. After teaching the web work in Vermont, he went west. He was a grand lecturer in Ohio from 1836 to 1843 and grand lecturer of the Grand Lodge of Illinois in 1846 and 1847. He died at Peoria, Illinois, June 22, 1847. He was the most influential ritualist of Vermont, Ohio, and Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and the states which have since become independently Masonically derived their work from these and follow the Barney work to the best of their knowledge. John Barney was the delegate from Ohio to the Baltimore Convention of 1843. Charles W. Moore of Massachusetts was also a delegate. In a letter written in 1863, he says, quote, The work and lectures of the first three degrees as adopted and authorized by the Baltimore Convention in 1843 were, with a few unimportant verbal exceptions, literally, as they were originally compiled by Brother Thomas S. Webb about the close of the last century, and as they were subsequently taught by him during his lifetime, and also by his early and favorite pupil, Brother Benjamin Gleason, from the years 1801 to 1802, until his death in 1847. In a note to me, under the date of November 25, 1843, Brother Gleason says, it was my privilege while at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, 
to acquire a complete knowledge of the lectures in the first three degrees of masonry directly from our late, much-lamented brother Thomas S. Webb. In 1805, Brother Gleason was commissioned by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts as its Grand Lecturer and empowered to visit and instruct the lodges in the ritual as he had received it from Webb. This duty he performed with great fidelity and to the entire satisfaction of the Grand Lodge, and this ritual is in use in the lodges of Massachusetts at the present time. There may be some verbal departures from the original, but no material change has been made in it. In 1823 and 24, Brother Gleason was my Masonic teacher. I learned the work and lectures from him. We were connected by family ties. And also, close Masonic relations continued to exist between us until his death in 1847. I was associated with him in all the various branches of Masonry for nearly a quarter of a century and enjoyed all the rare advantages of his extensive and accurate knowledge of the various rituals of the different grades of the order. In 1843, I was appointed by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, a delegate to the Baltimore Masonic Convention, called for the purpose of revising the various modes of work then in use, and agreeing upon a uniform system for the country. Before leaving home, and as a preparation for the better discharge of the duties of the appointment, I availed myself of the assistance of Brother Gleason in a thorough and careful revision of the lectures, which I had originally received from him, and which, on frequent occasions, I had been called to deliver and work with him, both in and out of the lodge. I was therefore qualified to report them to the convention through this committee work in their purity and integrity and, beyond all doubt, just as they originally came from the hand of the late Brother Webb. I had the honor to be a member of the committee and to report the amendments and the lectures as amended to the convention. This I did without notes, but subsequently took the precaution to minute down the alterations from the original, and these are now in my possession. They are mostly verbal, few in number, and not material in their results. The only change of consequence was in the due guards of the second and third degrees, which were changed and made to conform to that of the first degree in position and explanation. This was analogically correct." End quote. At this Baltimore convention, 16 of the 23 then existing Grand Lodges of the United States were represented, and the work adopted was called the National or Barney Work. No opposition of consequence to this work occurred until 1860 when Robert Morris tried to have a Preston Webb work as taught by Robert Morris adopted through the medium of a conservatives association. This conservatives association gained much influence and many brethren lent to their support. The plan was to have a conservator in each lodge who was to use his best efforts to promulgate the Webb Preston work as taught by Robert Morris. Each conservator was provided with a copy of mnemonics, which Robert Morris claimed was the true work. The Grand Lodges, however, became alarmed and promptly condemned the conservators in the early 60s. Most of them passed resolutions reaffirming the work as handed down through Gleason, Barney, Wilson, Wadsworth, Cross, and others, and as approved and recommended by the Baltimore Convention. Robert Morris claimed to have received the work from Brother Wilson of Vermont, but Brother Wilson says, quote, In 1857, Robert Morris visited Vermont for the purpose of ascertaining what were the true Webb lectures. P.C. Tucker introduced Morris to me for the purpose, and I loaned him a copy, not my original, of my cipher, and which unfortunately had several omissions through mistake. In copying this, Morris made several mistakes and misread many passages. In fact, he could never read it at all until I met him in Chicago in 1860, and I think he cannot read it all now. This copy, with its blunders and omissions, is the text from which the book you refer to, Mnemonics, was made." End quote. If we are correct in judging the condition which prevailed from 1843, when the Baltimore Convention was held, until the time of the Conservators Association, we would conclude that there was a difference in the work in the different jurisdictions which made a conservator movement possible. Robert Morris may have been sincerely desirous of promoting a uniform work and believed he could accomplish it. He probably could if he had possessed either the Preston work or the Webb work, but he had neither. His was a Morris work, and there had been too many changes to suit the brethren. And from then until now, the work adopted and maintained in the East and Northwest has been as near the web work as our ritualists could ascertain with exception of Pennsylvania, which still adheres to the ancient work. Books cited include Mackey's Encyclopedia, Article Lectures and Simple Questions and Answers, Hutchinson's Spirit of Masonry, A History of Freemasonry and Concordant Orders by Hahn. And that's the end of the piece. Now, I found this to be really interesting because 
While there's a lot of historical data and knowledge here, and a lengthy quote uh, where a grandmaster was talking about these kind of things, I think the takeaway is that, of course, Anderson wrote these things down, Preston released his work, and Thomas Smith Webb abridged it and rearranged it, and that's what we have, with the exception of where the Morris work was accepted and those conservators went through and a, and a few places probably still offer that work. So pretty interesting. So just remember that, right? We have Anderson, then a bunch of guys influence some additional Christian application, and then Preston does his thing, and then Thomas Smith Webb does his thing, and then Robert Morris does his thing which died because it was just too wild and different. So our first question for a Craftsman Plus out there is, does the ritual matter? Now, before you answer, the question is under this kind of idea that if the gist of what is to be said is said, does it truly matter which version of the ritual you're using? Or is it more important to have this pedigree of like a chain that has come from person to person to person under the idea of preservation over these kind of improvised works? Now, that's your question. I look forward to hearing your thoughts, specifically from our brothers out there who are very much into the ritual and teach it and frequently find themselves delivering ritual in Lodge. Next, let's get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. A couple of years ago, I joined the Red Cross of Constantine. It's a royal arch body with, shall we say, a bit of a complex degree structure compared to other Masonic organizations. Given a year of social distancing, I'm still a novice and not well versed in its organization and practices. Right after I joined, I attended what was only my fourth or fifth meeting. We held the meeting at a local restaurant with a spacious back room well suited for such purposes. I went in and stopped at a table to talk to the secretary. I mean the recorder. I still don't have a handle on all the officer's titles. As I was talking to him, a couple of other guys walked up behind me. It was a trap. Steve, they said in unison, the incoming sovereign needs a sentinel for next year. Would you be willing to step in and help him out? I babbled on about being honored, but having commitments, and not knowing if I could do justice to the job, and basically anything else I could think of that did not involve the word yes. It was three against one. Before I knew what had happened, I had agreed to be next year's sentinel. Not a big commitment, I told myself. And I'm helping the brothers. Yeah, actually, night companions. That settled, we sat down to open the chapter. Uh, I mean the conclave. I still have a lot to learn. It wasn't a standard opening since we were not in a lodge room, but we went through the verbal part of the ceremony. At one point, there came a series of knocks, followed by an uncomfortable silence. A friend seated next to me leaned over and whispered, Return the knocks. You're the sentinel. I whispered back, I thought that was next year. No. He said, I think you're the sentinel now. I knocked, and the remainder of the opening went off without a hitch. We had our dinner and started the business portion of the meeting. It came to light that Brother So-and-so, the thus-and-such officer, had to drop out of line. Discussion followed, and it became obvious all officers below thus and such, would move up. So I became the herald designate for next year. My buddy sitting next to me leaned over and said, Congratulations. Business finished, it was time to close. The formal closing proceeded until the eminent viceroy, second in command, declared the conclave closed and sealed the deal with the same series of knocks from the opening. 
Again, there was an uncomfortable period of silence. As before, the companion next to me stepped in. Steve, you're the Herald. You're supposed to return the wraps. I was confused. I thought I was the Sentinel. I'm supposed to be the Herald next term. No, he advised me. You're the Herald now. I followed up with raps that would make any Herald proud. So let's recap. I went into the meeting a member with no particular duties or responsibilities. Then I became the Sentinel designate. Then I became the Sentinel. Then I became the Herald designate. Then I became the Herald. That's the way it goes sometimes in our various Masonic bodies. I'm sure similar things have happened to others. It took me five years to become Worshipful Master of my Lodge, a journey that would ordinarily take ten in my jurisdiction. One brother I know did it in two. When membership declines, the brothers fall out of line for one reason or another, others have to step in. We all wish it was different, but Freemasonry isn't the only membership organization experiencing this in our activity-saturated lives today. So I'm glad my reluctance subsided and I'm able to step in and help out. I'm also honored they asked. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, did I, I, I just returned the knocks. I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> wow. I don't know how many times this kind of thing has happened to any of you out there. I've certainly showed up to a meeting and uh, filled in and then been elected. It does somehow feel like a trap sometimes. As illustrious Harrison has pointed out, we end up rationalizing the decision later. We're helping out brothers. It's not a big commitment. And usually that's pretty true. And, you know, sometimes we have some of the best times of our lives when we say yes, even though we don't always want to say it. But congratulations to Brother Steve for his uh, rapid promotion in the Red Cross of Constantine. If you enjoyed this story and others like it, please head on over to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel, like the videos. Brother Harrison puts these things together. He has actual videos that uh, we publish separately from the show also that you can watch. And uh, we've made, in some cases, some really great playlists of his videos. So check out those videos. And by all means, check out Steve's books. If you go to wcypodcast.com, click on the bookstore, and you'll find his books there. You can certainly click on those, go through the Amazon. They are affiliate links, so just so you know, and you are aware of that. But you can uh, buy his books through Amazon, and uh, it's a win-win-win. You get an awesome book, Steve gets a book sale, and of course, uh, a very little amount comes back to this show, but uh, you're helping out where you can. So no markup or anything. It's just kind of a win-win-win across the board. All right, let's continue our education as we dive into Max Heindel's Ancient and Modern Initiation, Part 2, Chapter 4, The Transfiguration. Here we go. We remember that by the mystic process of the true spiritual baptism, the aspirant becomes so thoroughly saturated with the universal spirit that as a matter of actual fact, feeling, and experience, he becomes one with all that lives, moves, and has its being, one with the pulsating divine life which surges in rhythmic cadence through the least and the greatest alike, and having caught the keynote of the celestial song, he is then imbued with a power of tremendous magnitude, which he may use either for good or ill. It should be understood and remembered that Though gunpowder and dynamite facilitate farming when used for blowing up tree stumps, which would otherwise require a great deal of manual labor to extract, they may also be used for destructive purposes, as in the Great European War. Spiritual powers also may be used for good or ill depending on the motive and character of the one who wields them. Therefore, whoever has successfully undergone the rite of baptism and thereby acquired spiritual power is forthwith tempted that it may be concerned 
decided whether he will range himself upon the side of good or evil. At this point he becomes either a future Parsifal, a Christ, a Herod, or a Klingsor, who fights the Knights of the Holy Grail with all powers and resources of the Brotherhood. There is a tendency in modern materialistic science to repudiate as fable, worthy of attention only among superstitious servant girls and foolish old women, the ideas commonly believed in as late as the Middle Ages, that such spiritual community, communities of the Knights of the Grail at one time existed, or that there are such beings as the Black Brothers. Occult societies in the last half century have educated themselves to the fact that the Good Brothers are still in evidence and may be found by those who seek them in the proper way. Now unfortunately the tendency among this class of people is to accept anyone on his unsupported claims as a master or an adept. But even among this class there are few who take the existence of the Black Brothers seriously, or realize what an enormous amount of damage they are doing in the world, and how they are aided and abetted by the general tendency of humanity to cater to the lusts of the flesh. As the good forces which are symbolized as the servants of the Holy Grail live and grow by unselfish service, which enhances the luster of the glowing Grail cup, so the powers of evil, known as the Black Grail, and represented in the Bible as the court of Herod, feed on pride and sensuality, voluptuousness and passion embodied in the figure of Salam, who glories in the murder of John the Baptists and the Innocents. It was shown in the legend of the Grail as embodied in Wagner's Parsifal, that when the knights were denied the love and service, their courage flagged and they became inert. Similarly, with the brothers of the Black Grail, unless they are provided with the words of wickedness, they will die from starvation. Therefore, they are ever active in the world, stirring up strife and inciting others to evil. Were not this pernicious activity counteracted in a great measure by the elder brothers at their midnight services, at which they make themselves magnets for all the evil thoughts in the western world, and then by the alchemy of sublime love transmute them to good, a cataclysm of still greater magnitude that the recent world war would have occurred long ago? As it is, the genius of evil has been held within bounds in some measure at least. Were humanity not so ready to range itself on the side of evil, success would have been greater. But it is hoped that the spiritual awakening started by the war will result in turning the scale and give the construction agencies in evolution the upper hand. It is a wonderful power which is centered in the Christian mystic at the time of the baptism by descent and concentration within him of the universal spirit and when he has refused during the period of temptation to desecrate it for personal profit or power, he must of necessity give it vent in another direction, for he is impelled by an irresistible inner urge which will not allow him to settle down to an inert, inactive life of prayer and meditation. The power of God is upon him to preach, and glad tidings to humanity to help and heal. We know that a stove which is filled with burning fuel cannot help heating the surrounding atmosphere Neither can the Christian mystic help radiating the divine compassion which fills his heart to overflowing, nor is he doubt whom to love, or whom to serve, or where to find his opportunity. As the stove filled with burning fuel radiates heat to all who are within its sphere of radiation, so the Christian mystic feels the love of God burning within his heart and is continually radiating it to all with whom he comes into contact. As the heated stove draws to itself by its genial warmth, those who are suffering with physical cold, so the warmth love rays of the Christian mystic are as a magnet to all those whose hearts are chilled by the cruelty of the world, by man's inhumanity to man. If the stove were empty but endowed with the faculty of speech, it might preach forever the gospel of warmth to those who are physically cold, but even the finest oratory would fail to satisfy its audience. When it has been filled, with fuel, and radiates warmth, there will be no need of preaching. Men will come to it and be satisfied. Similarly, a sermon on the brotherhood by one who has not laved in the fountain of life will sound hollow. The true mystic need not preach. His every act, even his silent presence, is more powerful than all the most deeply thought out discourses of learned doctors of philosophy. There is a story of St. Francis Assisi which particularly illustrates this fact, and which we trust may serve to drive it home. 
for it is exceedingly important. It is said that one day St. Francis went to a young brother in the monastery with which he was then connected and said to him, Brother, let us go down to the village and preach to them. The young brother was naturally overjoyed at the honor and opportunity of accompanying so hold a man as St. Francis, and together the two started toward the village, talking all the while about spiritual things and the life that leads to God. Engrossed in the conversation, they passed through the village, walking along its various streets, now and then stopping to speak kindly a word to one or another of the villagers. After having made a circuit of the village, St. Francis was heading toward the road, which led to the monastery, when all of a sudden the young brother reminded him of his intention to preach in the village and ask him if he had forgotten it. To this, St. Francis answered, My son, are you not aware that all the while we have been in this village, we have been preaching to the people all around us? In the first place, our simple dress proclaims the fact that we are devoted to the service of God. And, as soon as anyone sees us, his thoughts naturally turn heavenward. Be sure that every one of the villagers has been watching us, taking note of our demeanor to see in how far it conforms with our profession. They have listened to our words to find whether they were about spiritual or profane subjects. They have watched our gestures and have noted that the words of sympathy we dispensed came straight from our hearts and went deep into theirs. We have been preaching a far more powerful sermon than if we had gone into the marketplace, called them around us, and started to harangue them with an exhortation to holiness. St. Francis was a Christian mystic in the deepest sense of the word, and being taught from within by the Spirit of God who knew well the mysteries of life, as did Jacob Bohm and other holy men who have been similarly taught. They are in a certain sense wiser than the wisest of the intellectual school, but it is not necessary for them to expound great mysteries in order to fulfill their mission and serve as guideposts to others who are also seeking God. The very simplicity of their words and acts carries with it the power of conviction. Naturally, of course, all do not rise to the same heights. All have not the same powers any more than all the stoves are of the same size and have the same heating capacity. Those who follow the Christian mystic path, from the least to the greatest, have experienced the powers conveyed by baptism according to their capacity. They have been tempted to use those powers in an evil direction for personal gain and have overcome the desire for the world and worldly things that they have turned to the path of ministry and service as Christ did. Their lives are marked not so much by what they have said as by what they have done. The true Christian mystic is easily distinguished. He never uses the six weekdays to prepare for a grand oratorical effort to thrill his hearers on Sunday, but spends every day alike in humble endeavor to do the Master's will regardless of outward applause. Thus unconsciously, he works up toward that grand climax which, in the history of the most noblest of all who have trod this path, is spoken of as the transfiguration. The transfiguration is an alchemical process by which the physical body formed by the chemistry of physiological processes is turned into a living stone, such as is mentioned in the Bible. The medieval alchemists who were seeking the philosopher's stone were not concerned with the transmutation of such dross as material god, but aimed at a greater goal, as indicated above. Moisture gathered in the clouds falls to earth as rain when it has condensed sufficiently, and it is again evaporated into the clouds by the heat of the sun. This is the primal cosmic formula. Spirit also condenses into the matter and becomes mineral, but though it be crystallized into the harness of the flint, life still remains, and by the alchemy of nature working through another life stream, the dense mineral constituents of the soil are transmuted to a more flexible structure in the plant, which may be used as food for animal and man. These substances become sentient flesh by the alchemy of assimilation. When we note the changes in the structure of the human body evidenced by comparison of the Bushmen, Chinese, Hindus, Latins, Celts, and Anglo-Saxons, it is plainly apparent that the flesh of man is even now undergoing a refining process which is eradicating the coarser, grosser substances. In time, by evolution, this process of spiritualization will render our flesh transparent and radiant with the light that shines within. Radiant as the face of Moses, the body of Buddha, and the Christ at the Transfiguration. At present, the effulgence of the indwelling spirit is effectually darkened by our dense body, but we may draw up even from the science of chemistry, 
There is nothing on earth so rare and precious as radium, the luminous extract of the dense black mineral called pitch blende. And there is nothing so rare as the precious extract of the human body, the radiant Christ. At present, we are laboring to form the Christ within, but when the inner Christ has grown to full stature, he will shine through the transparent body as the light of the world. It is an anatomical fact of common knowledge that the spinal cord is divided into three sections from which the motor, sensory, and sympathetic nerves are controlled. Astrologically, these are ruled by the Moon, Mars, and Mercury, which are divine hierarchies that have played a great role in human evolution through the nervous systems indicated. Among the ancient alchemists, these were designated by the three alchemical elements, salt, sulfur, and mercury. Between them, and upon them, played the spirit fire of Neptune. It rose in a serpentine column through the spinal cord to the ventricles of the brain. In the great majority of mankind, the spirit fire is still exceedingly weak, but whenever the spiritual awakening occurs in anyone such as that which takes place in the genuine conversion, or better still at the baptism of the Christian mystic, the downpouring of the spirit, which is an actual fact, augments the spinal spirit fire to an almost unbelievable extent, and forthwith a process of regeneration begins whereby the gross substances of the threefold body of many are gradually thrown out, rendering the vehicles more permeable and quickly responsive to the spiritual impulses. The further the process if carried, the more efficient servants they become in the vineyard of the Master. The spiritual awakening which starts this process of regeneration is in the Christian mystic who purifies himself by prayer and service, comes also, of course, to those who are seeking God by way of knowledge and service, but it acts in a different way, which is noted by the spiritual investigator. In the Christian mystic, the regenerative spinal spirit fire is concentrated principally upon the lunar segment of the spinal cord, which governs the sympathetic nerves under the rulership of Jehovah. Therefore, his spiritual growth is accomplished by faith as simple, childlike, and unquestioning as it was in the days of early Atlantis, when men were mindless. He therefore draws down the great white light of the deity, reflects through Jehovah, the Holy Spirit, and attains the whole wisdom of the world without the necessity of laboring for it intellectually. This gradually transmutes his body into the white philosopher's stone, the diamond soul. In those, on the other hand, whose minds are strong and insistent on knowing the reason why and the wherefore of every dictum and dogma, the spinal fire of regeneration plays upon the segments of the red Mars and the colorless Mercury, endeavoring to infuse desire with reason, to purify the former of the primal passion that it may become chaste as the rose, and thus transmute the body into the ruby soul, the red philosopher's stone, tried by fire, purified, a creative budding, individuality. All who are upon the path, whether the path of occultism or of mysticism, are weaving the golden wedding garment by this work from within and from without. In some the gold is exceedingly pale and in others it is deeply red, but eventually when the process of transfiguration has been completed, or rather when it is nearing completion, the extremes will blend and the transfigured bodies will become balanced in color. For the occultist must learn the lesson of deep devotion, and the Christian mystic must learn how to acquire knowledge by his own efforts without drawing upon the universal source of all wisdom. This view gives us a deeper insight into the transfiguration reported in the Gospels. We should remember distinctly that it was the vehicles of Jesus which were transfigured, temporarily by the indwelling Christ Spirit. But even while allowing for the enormous potency of the Christ Spirit in effecting the transfiguration, it is evident that Jesus must be sublime character without a peer. The transfiguration as seen in the memory of nature reveals his body as a dazzling white, thus showing his dependence upon the Father, the universal spirit. There is a great diversity in present attainments, but in the kingdom of Christ the differences will gradually disappear, and a uniform color indicating both knowledge and devotion will be acquired by all. This color will correspond to the pink color seen by occultists as the spiritual sun, the vehicle of the Father. When this has been accomplished, the transfiguration of humanity will be complete. We shall then be one with our Father, and his kingdom will have come. All right, super deep stuff. Now, some of the illustrations of this book I've passed over, and I don't really talk about them while we're doing the reading. But when we're all done with this, 
I will for sure uh, put this PDF up there for you all to download if you haven't already found it online somewhere. One of the really interesting parts about this narrative that I was attracted to was this idea of an, a radiant eminence coming from within to the outside world. Uh, so number one, I think this was great because it corollary to the religious story of, of Jesus, right? As he, as one would picture him kind of radiating light before ascending. And all that's left perhaps is the shroud. If you look at some of the documentation or some of the more well-produced documentaries regarding the Shroud of Turin, for instance, whether you believe that to be a real thing or perhaps a fake, they've done some interesting work in saying that the image may have been radiated up onto the shroud, which is just fascinating to me anyway, in a field of science for sure, uh, but also in, in kind of the, the mysticism realm. My question for the Craftsman Plus for this particular piece of the paper is actually relating to an earlier part where we're talking about St. Francis of Assisi. So St. Francis says, we've, we've actually walked through and we've proselytized just by being here, our, our mere presence. While people see us, they know they should look to the heavens. They know that should, they should be good. And they hear what we're talking about. And they know that it's now okay to talk about things of the spirit. Now, in a non-religious kind of way, I think about masonry in this same light. Masons, while walking the streets, do people not know them by their good deeds? Do people not know them by the things that they're talking about, by not talking about things like gossip, but instead having intellectual conversations? Many a time I have been out to lunch talking with my brothers about philosophical topics, and many times uh, we will get the eyes of people walking by or people sitting next to us will look over. And even on one or two occasions, we've had people say, as they were getting up to leave, saying, I'm sorry, we couldn't help but overhear some of the stuff you guys were talking about. It is quite interesting to find a group of young gentlemen talking about things of this nature. And then they asked, are we part of a church group or something? And we said, no, we're just talking philosophy. They said, well, are you going to a school? No, we were just uh, individuals who like to talk about these kinds of things. Uh, so it was really interesting. Again, long-winded here, but the question for the Craftsman Plus is, do you feel that Masons can have that same kind of effect, or is that argument similar? And relating it back to the story of St. Francis of Assisi. That's it for this week. I really hope you enjoyed our two really cool papers that gave us some uh, incredible insights into the Christian mystic, as well as now you know about uh, Anderson's constitutions and where our ritual comes from and, and whatnot, and all of this kind of tracing of lineage of documents. Now, of course, that was written back in uh, the early 20th century. Perhaps there are revisions and things that have been, you know, reproven or uh, proven false. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed. Now, one more time, I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, our legacy partners. Please, you guys, thank you so much. I want to give this stuff away to you, so please enter the contest. Go on there, totally free, fill out the form, and enjoy. You only have a few days left. I'm going to stop the responses on midnight on April 7th, and then I will begin the review process, and I will get this stuff out to you well in time for you to enjoy. If you're not yet a supporter and you want in on this contest, you have to sign up on either Patreon or PayPal to do so, and you'll see the link, or I will send you a link uh, in order to take that quiz. No matter where I am, even if I'm on my phone, I'll send you the link and you'll see sent from my iPhone because I'm that fired up about this and I want everybody to have a chance to uh, win this stuff. It's going to be really awesome. And for those of you who are not interested, that's okay too. I want to thank you guys for listening as well. Please check out the Fraternal Review. Go to the researchlodge.com and check out this Four Cardinal Virtues uh, limited edition set. It is not going to last long. They made a hundred of these and there's like, you know, a bazillion people who want this thing. And when we posted pictures of it, people were drooling. Okay, so <laughs> uh, they did an exceptional job here. Brother Dago Rodriguez did uh, amazing things. They're, they're people who laid this thing out. The entire officer line, these dudes know what they're doing. Uh, so check them out. 
and also check out Esotericon. I, I don't think you have any time left to get an early bird ticket, but uh, you know what? Try anyway. See what you can get. Go over to the website. We'll have a link back to their website in the show notes as well as the Southern California Research Lodge. And uh, that's it. Thank you guys all so much for listening. And until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, brother, Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.